So what we'll do, we'll just have a, a short set. We'll maybe sit for 20 minutes together. But uh, for those of you that are not uh, used to doing this, as I say, place your attention on the sensations of your breath. And you'll find that your attention doesn't stay there for very long. <laughs> and that's all right when you realize that you're no longer paying attention to the sensations of your breath. Just gently bring your attention back and start observing those sensations again. Until the next time your mind wanders away. Now, uh, actually, there's two kinds of things. What, one thing that will happen is that uh, a, a thought or sound or something will take your attention away briefly, and, and you'll forget the meditation object, but you'll remember it right away. And when you do, just bring it back. The other thing that will happen is a thought or, or some other distraction will take your attention away from the sensation of the breath. And you won't realize it right away. And that thought will lead to another thought, and will lead to another thought, and you may have a long period of mind wandering. And so you can expect that to happen too. But the same thing, at some point, you will realize that you're no longer paying attention to your breath. So whether it happens immediately, or whether it happens after five minutes of mind wandering, what I really want you to pay attention to is the difference in the state of your mind in the moment when you realize that you're not doing what you intended to, as compared to the immediately preceding moment when you were lost in some thought about whatever. Because it, in that moment, you are going to be more wide awake, more present than you normally are. And that's actually where you want to be all the time. And one of the purposes of meditation is to help bring us into the present so we are fully present, not only fully present, but fully aware. The sensations of your breath that you keep returning to are happening right now. And your mind can dull out and zone out and you won't perceive them very clearly. Or you can be very, very clearly, uh, intensely, uh, vividly aware of those sensations. And so don't worry about anything that <clears throat> happens. All your, uh, the, the whole purpose of, of what you're doing is training the mind so that your mind will uh, <coughs> stably attend to whatever it is you choose to uh, observe or investigate. And that secondly, that you'll do it with a uh, strong mindfulness, powerful, mindful awareness. So this is where meditation takes us to the place of Having, having a trained mind that allows us to observe whatever we want with powerful, mindful awareness. So right away in this first, for those of you who've never meditated before, you're going to get a taste of the whole thing. That, that, that taste of uh, awakening to the present that you'll have every single time you realize that your mind has wandered. Uh, notice that and savor that and recognize that for the, the kind of uh, awareness that you want to have all the time. And then try to try to keep it, try to hold on to it for as long as you can when you go back to observing the sensations of the breath. In the process of this, you will, as I said, you'll discover how busy your mind is. All you're trying to do is just sit here, relax, be completely peaceful, uh, and watch your breath go in and out. That's what you're trying to do. You're going to discover your mind is just all over the place. And if you pay attention to it, you'll probably end up asking yourself, why on earth is that stuff even in my head to begin with? Because uh, a, a lot of it doesn't make that much sense. But uh, that's the essence. That's the essence of what we're going to do. And I should probably give you enough to go on uh, for, this, for this little sit that we're going to do together. Do you have any questions about it? Do you think you know how to do it? Um, you'll find that the human body is not used to staying still for very long. And so 20 minutes is probably going to seem a lot longer than uh, it usually does. And you'll have the thought, uh, you know, I'm sure that timer that Joel gave him isn't working. <laughs> we must be into the second hour now. <laughs>
but it won't be true. Um, if, if the discomfort in your body becomes strong enough that it is definitely interfering with you just trying to pay attention to your breath, then uh, play a little trick on your mind. Instead of paying attention to the breath, pay attention to that uncomfortable sensation. And then meditate the same way there. You'll be, it'll be easier to stay with the uncomfortable sensation than it actually is with the breath. Yes? How important do you think it is to keep the body still? It's very important to keep the body still. Um, the reason is, if you sit still for very long, uh, there comes an urge to move. And the subtle sensations expand in your mind to become desperate needs to relieve something by, by moving. And uh, unless you, right at the beginning of your practice, overcome that, your practice will become a process of sitting there wiggling and jiggling and stretching and shifting and straightening and unstraightening one leg or another and trying to, trying to get comfortable. And no matter how long you sit for, it'll be a period of doing little other than trying to get comfortable. Uh, because it's a self-reinforcing process. If uh, you have discomfort, you have the urge to move, and then you move, then that, uh, that causes the next discomfort to arise, and the process just accelerates. And uh, if you sit for an hour without being still, if, if you were to actually look at uh, how most of that time is spent, most of that time is spent noticing and thinking about this discomfort or that and deciding whether to move or not or when to move and all of these other sorts of things. And that does not accomplish the goals of meditation. So sitting still is very important. So try to sit completely still. Now, you may come to a point, and especially if this is your first time sitting still, the first time you sit still for 20 minutes in your life, you might come to a point where you absolutely have to move. And that's all right. When you reach the point that you know you're going to move, then go ahead. You have its clear decision. Okay, I am going to move. So decide exactly how you're going to move. And be mindful of that movement in the same way you be mindful of the sensation of the breath going in and out. And once you've made the movement, go back to observing the sensations of the breath and wait until the next urge to move comes, because it will. <laughs> the point is that... Uh, to the best of your ability, you try not to move. And if you do that in, uh, in a fairly short period of time, you won't any longer have the need to move. And you succeed in not moving by, if discomfort becomes strong enough, taking that as your meditation object. Uh, and then if, what, what will happen won't happen the first time necessarily, but what will happen if you do that, if you have the pain in your body and you take that as your meditation object and you investigate it and you look at it and you see where it is and how big it is, and whether it's moving or not, and whether it's getting stronger or weaker or not, you know, just investigate it, just examine it. It will, sometimes it will just disappear and then you go back to meditate. Other times it won't disappear, but it will just become a sensation and it will no longer be bothersome enough that you uh, need to pay attention to it. So then you just go back to your meditation object and continue with your meditation. But anytime it becomes strong enough that it is successfully drawing your attention away, rather than interrupt your practice, and your practice is just to be paying attention to what you intend to pay attention to rather than letting your mind do whatever it wants. So if at any time it's succeeding in drawing your attention away, then you finesse the situation by taking the discomfort as a meditation object. And that should work even for those of you who don't use a meditation object and are doing just sitting. Any questions? Everybody ready to sit? Get as comfortable as you can. Make yourself comfortable. Close your eyes and uh, I always find that it is very useful in the first few moments when you're sitting after you've closed your eyes, become fully aware of your body. Just feel, feel the uh, weight of your 
of the weight of your body that is uh, pressing against the cushion. Feel the air on your skin. Feel the clothing touching your body. Come into that full body awareness. And then if you're doing the practice I just described, then just bring that awareness to, the, to your nose and begin to observe the sensations of the breath as they go in and out. And this timer will go 20 minutes from now.
So now that you've just spent some time sitting in meditation, it would be a really good time to ask questions about meditation. Especially those of you who have just tried it for the first time. Or to make comments. Well, I was going to say, what do you suggest for people who are often sleepy and are trying not to fall asleep while they're sleeping? Ah, yes. That's a, an excellent question. And just so that you know, it's not... It's not a kind of people that's like that. It's everybody. It's a stage that you have to go through if you take up meditation as a practice. Now, uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, you close your eyes, you withdraw your attention from all other sources of stimuli, and your mind tends to do the same thing that it's done, you know, probably at least once a day every your, uh, your entire life, which is to go to sleep. And uh, if you've just, if this is your first time meditating and you experience that, that's not at all unusual. But it's actually a stage that people go through in meditation. When, you, when your concentration reaches a certain point, you naturally tend to start slipping into dullness and to fall asleep. You know, if you let it go far enough, you fall, yeah, fall asleep. So that's actually a stage in becoming a skilled meditator that everyone has to go through. And the way that you deal with it is that, um, first of all, you need to recognize when it's beginning to happen, when the dullness starts to show up. You know, at, at first, you won't recognize it until it's already quite strong. You won't recognize it until there's a, a, a strong drowsiness present. But you can come to recognize it at a much earlier stage. So uh, in terms of overcoming this kind of dullness that leads to drowsiness once and for all, it's all a matter of learning to recognize it as early as possible and then applying an appropriate antidote to overcome it. And that's the second part, is that whenever you do realize that uh, there is dullness present, to apply an appropriate antidote to bring you out of it, to bring you completely out of it. Uh, and you'll know that your, the antidote that you employed was strong enough if it brings you back to a state of awake alertness that lasts for several minutes. May be that after several minutes, once again, you start slipping into dullness. That's typical of the stage of the practice where a meditator has to deal with dullness and learns to overcome it once and for all. But uh, the goal is to bring yourself fully alert or you stay that way for a few minutes. And then if you go back into dullness again, you recognize it, apply the antidote again. Uh, so that's how to tell when the antidote is strong enough. Uh, it's not strong enough if you bring yourself back into a state of wakefulness and almost immediately, within seconds, you have the sensation of sinking back into dullness. Then it wasn't strong enough. So the different kinds of, of antidotes to use, you're sitting and meditating, and you have a feeling of drowsiness, you can take several very deep breaths and let them out against resistance. You go, And as you do that, you will feel the rush of energy and it'll wake you up. And if it was strong enough for the dullness that you were dealing with, it will last for, for several minutes. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can just tighten up all the muscles in your body and tighten them up as strong as you can and hold them and then release them and relax and repeat that several times. That will wake you up. So this is good against sort of the medium strength dullness. It's just the beginning of of actual sleepiness, a kind of drowsy feeling, but uh, you, you're not already into the nodding state. And it's stronger than you need when you're at the stage where uh, your mind is just losing its clarity and vividness of perception. So it's about, it's about the medium strength antidote 
that you probably use most often uh, in the process of learning to deal with dullness. Now, when dullness becomes stronger, when that when that's not enough, when you do that and you still experience sinking right afterwards, then you have to do something that uh, uh, will wake you up more. Stand up, meditate standing up. It's not very comfortable, you won't do it for very long, but it will wake you up. And uh, then sit down, you may have to stand up again. If that's not strong enough, do a walking meditation. And when you feel like you're fully awake, then go back and sit down. And if that's not strong enough, go into the bathroom and splash some cold water on your face, and then go back and sit down and meditate again. So whatever antidote you use, what you don't want to do is, is to surrender to the dullness. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, surrendering to the dullness can mean that you just decide, oh, the heck with it, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> or the other way of surrendering to it is just allowing yourself to sink into, you're still sitting there, you know, but you just don't want to fight against it. You just, you know, you, you figure as long as you don't actually fall over, it's okay. <laughs> that's, still, that's, that's still surrendering to it. You, you, not surrendering to it means bringing yourself back to a state of being awake. And if you do that over and over again, just, just keep repeating it as often as necessary, what will happen during the course of a single sit where you're experiencing dullness is, uh, well, of course, you may, it may be the whole experience of your sit and the bell rings and it's time to quit. And that's all that happened is you just slipped into dullness, brought yourself out of it for a few minutes, slipped in again, brought yourself out. That might be the whole, and that's quite all right. That's perfectly all right. You have to do that some unknown number of times before you get to the place where it's never a problem anymore. So while it's happening, you just do it. Okay. But what will what will start happening though is you'll dullness will come on and you'll bring yourself out of it and that'll happen a few times and then you'll find yourself really wide awake and you'll stay that way for the rest of the set. And that's where that's what you're looking for. You're looking for to get to that place where as soon as you notice dullness, you bring yourself out of it and that's it. It's gone once and for all. Now I, I talked about medium strong dullness and medium strength antidotes and very strong dullness and very strong antidotes. There's also subtle dullness and there's the antidotes to that. Subtle dullness is when you realize that your perception is not as clear. Your mind is just not as sharp and alert as it is. It's accompanied by a subtle feeling of, of comfortableness and easiness and you can Fool yourself into thinking that, oh, I'm getting to be a really good meditator because it seems like your attention is more stable. But it's a kind of subtle dullness. And, and if you're observing the sensations of the breath, they won't really be clear. And they'll sometimes take on uh, imagery that, that has nothing to do with the breath, sort of dreamlike images associated with the sensations, things like that. So you know that dullness is present when you're experiencing that. So, but you might not necessarily have to do anything quite as strong as what I've described so far. So milder, milder approaches can work. The mildest antidote is to just bring your attention back to your meditation object and brighten up your awareness. If you catch it early enough, that might be all that it takes. Um, another thing that you can do is that um, part of what seems to invite the dullness is the fact that our attention is very focused. And as a matter of fact, getting to the stage where you have a lot of dullness is a good sign. It means you've developed a certain degree of concentration, that your mind is able to become calm and, and, and be more focused. So uh, one way to deal with subtle dullness is just to reverse that. Instead of having your awareness focus, become aware of all the sensations in your body just to expand your awareness. Uh, expand your awareness to include sounds. Expand your awareness just so that you have that perception of being in the place that you're in. You know. and, and that should bring you out of it and then you can go back to uh, 
practicing as you were before. Another thing that's very helpful when dullness is not very strong is to uh, open your eyes. And meditating with your eyes open is a very good way of overcoming subtle dullness. And it's something that is worth uh, learning to do. At first, when you do it, you might find it agitating to the mind and, and distracting. And of course, it's the very same thing that causes it to be agitating to the mind, which allows it to be a good antidote to dullness. But those are different ways of dealing with it. So, uh, I'll just reiterate the most important principles is recognize it as soon as possible. Uh, don't get into a bad mood about it. I'm uh, having a terrible meditation because I'm dull or I'm drowsy. And match the antidote to the, to the dullness so that it's sufficient to bring you out of it for several minutes at least. And that's it. And uh, everyone who meditates goes through uh, a stage where they have to train their mind not to retreat into this dull state. And it's a very important thing to do. If you don't do that, you can develop the ability to sit in a mild state of dullness and convince yourself that the that the focus and the comfort that you have in that state is good meditation, and it's not. It's actually uh, pretty much a waste of time. I mean, it, it accomplishes the same thing for your mind and body that having a cat nap does. You know? But other than that, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not good for very much. Uh, would you address body posture and alignment? The question is, uh, would I address body alignment and posture and the importance of that? Well, from my point of view, the most important thing about your posture, that your meditation position is that it be comfortable for you in terms of your particular body and its needs to allow you to sit and not be unduly distracted by physical discomfort. So you can meditate. There's many different meditation positions. Uh, this is called cross-legged. The Burmese position is with one leg in front of the other. Then there's the half lotus with one, one foot on top of the other, and the full lotus with the feet on opposite knees. Uh, sitting in a chair, sitting, uh, uh, standing, lying, walking. There act actually is no one meditation posture. The most important thing about your meditation posture, above all, is that you can sit for a good long period of time, at least a half an hour, preferably an hour or more, without your body getting in the way of <coughs> meditation practice. The, the word for meditation in uh, uh, the, the language of the Buddha is bhavana, and it means mental training. And so that's what meditation is, is training your mind. You don't want your body to get in the way of something that is primarily involving your mind. And so find a, play, a position that's comfortable. Keep in mind, if you're too comfortable, unnecessarily comfortable, you'll fall asleep more easily. Um, and also keep in mind that it is next to impossible to find a position that is completely comfortable for a long period of time. Um, even when a person goes to sleep, they keep moving because there is no position that the body stays completely comfortable in for very long. Right? So uh, find the most comfortable position to sit in that you can and experiment with it. Uh, sit on benches uh, if you need to. Sit on cushions. Uh, put supports under your knees if you need to. Do whatever you need to to get comfortable. In general, you will find that um, sitting in some kind of cross-legged position, for most people, unless you have hip or knee problems, sitting in some sort of cross-legged position will be, whether it's cross-legged like I am, or Burmese, or, or 
after full lotus is probably going to be one of the best positions. It still may need some tuning on it. You may need to uh, put a cushion under your buttocks like one of these uh, uh, Zafus that uh, several of you are using. Other people may need to put a cushion under one knee or the other or both and fine tune that, you know, that a half an inch of elevation and support can make a world of difference. Then your back needs to be in a natural position so that your body remains upright without straining any of your muscles. If you slumped forward, that's going to, that's going to produce tension, pain, spasms, and the muscles in your back. If you lean too far back, same problem. If you lean to one side or the other. So it just makes sense that your head and your neck and your spine need to be straight and not stick straight, natural body curve straight, you know, the way the spine naturally is. So if your head is basically balanced over the center of gravity of your body, then your head isn't, the weight of your head isn't going to stress your neck muscles. And the same thing, it just follows right on down to where you make contact with your seat. So the more in balance you are, the longer you're going to be able to sit there with the least amount of discomfort. It's going to take the least amount of muscle effort to keep you from falling over in one direction or another. Sometimes you'll come across all this stuff about how absolutely important it is that your spine be straight because the prana or the inner winds or the chi has to do this or that. And uh, don't worry about that. When you, if, if that's ever going to be important, it's going to be quite a ways down the road when, when you're in a very advanced state of practice, and most likely it's never going to become an issue. Okay? Uh, you want your shoulders to be even for all the same reasons I've just described. You want your arms in balance, and usually to support your hands, you can put your arms resting your hands on your knees or in your lap. And most people are going to find the lap is more comfortable. Uh, this does produce some tension in the shoulders, and most people will find that that's not quite as comfortable as putting your hands in your lap. If you put your hands in your lap, uh, you need, you know, my trousers or shirt or whatever it is usually make a fold that's just enough to support my hands, the weight of my hands, in the right position. If the way that your dress doesn't do that and your hands are down here, this is going to create tension in, in, as well. So if you sit with your hands in your lap, they should be just, just about where your belt would be. Okay. And if you need to take a small cushion or a rolled up towel and put that you know, there to rest your hands on, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. Better than having your shoulders aching 20 minutes into your sit, you know, feeling like somebody's sticking knives in between your shoulder blades. So, but if you, if you balance your body in that way with your hands and your arms and your shoulders at the same level and your uh, uh, back straight, uh, front to back and side to side, your head and neck back in alignment, then that's the most important thing. Could be cross-legged on the floor with appropriate cushions, could be in a chair, The most important thing, though, is to get to that place where you can sit easily for as long as possible. If you really get into meditation, if you start to discover some of the wonderful things that come with meditation, you could very well find yourself sitting for several hours at a time. But you can't do that if your body is aching. Um, and as far as the bodily discomfort goes, as I mentioned, there is no position that you can sit in that is perfectly comfortable. But part of learning to meditate is learning to uh, focus your mind in such a way that the minor discomforts of your body cease to be a problem. And as a matter of fact, if you develop concentration, there's a particular stage in the development of concentration where perception of your body, to body totally changes, and there is no pain and discomfort at all, absolutely none. Your body feels perfectly still, 
perfectly comfortable, and you feel as though you could sit forever, and you can certainly sit for hours. And, and it's not like there's some pain there that you're ignoring. There's no pain at all. As a matter of fact, it, the stages it goes through at first, it's just very still and comfortable. Then your body just starts to be suffused with this subtle pleasure. You know, it's very, very delightful. You don't have any of the normal sensations. You can't feel your shirt against your skin. You know, all you feel is this, this lovely, subtle, pleasurable sense that replaces the normal sense of the body. Yeah. I have a question about uh, external and internal sounds. What do you do about that? I mean, I get like uh, subtle internal humming or hissing or buzzing or that thing, and then there's external sounds. Well, I disregard internal sounds the same way you would that you would external sounds. That's hard. That's, my mind just goes towards it like a bee, like a flower. Well, and if that happens, uh, you might try facing it slightly away from me. Maybe that will work. If, if that happens, what you can do is you can focus your attention on the internal sound for, for a little while. And it should have the effect that your mind will lose that fascination with the sound. And then you could go back to whatever other meditation object that you're using. But it's not good to use that as an object rather than... Well, actually, you can, and there are uh, there are meditation practices that do that. If you if you meditate in such a way that you develop strong concentration, uh, you will develop. Uh, uh, there's several things that happen. One of them is that pleasant feeling in the body that I mentioned. Another one is that you'll have an experience of there being a light behind your closed eyes. I which can become very bright. And another one of them is that you'll hear a sound. And for some people, it can be a very beautiful, pleasant sound. For some people, it's just a buzzing or, or whatever. But all of these are, uh, none of them are important in themselves. Um, they are evidence of the developing, uh, your developing skill in meditation and the power of your concentration. But they can be used as a meditation object. The lights, some people will, when the lights arise, they will cease to attend to their other meditation object, take the light as a meditation object, and use it to enter deep states of absorption that are called jhanas. Um, and you can also do something similar with the sound. There's a kind of meditation that is used by some Indian schools. It's called light and sound meditation. And that's what they do. They, develop concentration until the light comes and the sound comes and then they use that as meditation object thereafter. So, uh, there's nothing essentially wrong with that and it, it, can, it can be turned into a productive meditation object. But I would say for most people, in most cases, the best thing to do with these things is just to, just to let them be. Just after a while, they become a familiar part of what happens when you sit down and meditate. There are a way that you have of gauging the, the, the depth of your own concentration as it's developing. Yes? You know, for some people that maybe have a, a lot of things going on, it would be better for them to like set aside a large block of time, let's say once a week, or a small amount of time on a daily basis in order to, to develop your meditation practice? Uh, the question is whether it uh, would be better, with somebody who has a lot of things going on in their life, whether it's better to set aside a block of time once a week or to have a daily meditation practice. And I, I would recommend the daily meditation practice because most of us, you know, do have a lot going on in our lives, and maybe more at some times than others. So, uh, if you could take the approach that if you develop your meditation practice with a mind that has an ordinary sort of level of 
distraction taking place in it already, then you're going to develop the skill to, to calm that mind down. And then you're going to have the benefit of that skill, the benefit of that calm mind, as you go about your daily activities. You see, somebody could do a meditation retreat. They could go into a retreat, a two-week retreat, and reach really deep stages of meditation. And it's, oh, this is wonderful. And then they go back into the world. And two days later, they're getting all agitated, and they can't meditate like they did. And by the end of the week, everything, it seems as though they lost everything they gained during their retreat. They didn't, in fact. But, uh, because you never really, really lose it. But what you can accomplish in a block of time that's set aside where while you're not only practicing meditation, the distractions that are usually present have been removed as well, is not going to work quite as well as meditating, as, 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 as meditating while you're in the midst of the storm of your life and learning to calm your mind when that, all that stuff is going on. Yes? Would you recommend any kind of a herbal tea or something to help someone maintain mindfulness, alertness, and calmness? I don't know of anything that will really do that. But if I did, I'd recommend that you avoid it because if there was a pill or a tea or anything that could produce that effect, then you wouldn't learn to do it. You wouldn't be able to train your mind to do it. And that's really what this is all about. I mean, but where this conversation could go from here is into why do we meditate? <laughs> and we meditate, we meditate to, to train the mind, to cultivate... Uh, the ability to focus what in our ordinary speech we would refer to as concentration, but basically uh, to have control over the movement of the mind. And the other thing that we uh, train ourselves to do in meditation is to be in a very uh, high state of alert awareness, to have powerful mindful awareness. And so, we meditate in order to have the kind of mind that it really serves us to have. Our objectives could be many. It, it brings calm, it brings peace, it makes it easier to deal with stress. It lowers blood pressure. Uh, it has many beneficial effects on the body and the mind. It uh, makes us less reactive and allows us to deal with stress more easily and difficult interpersonal interactions and all these other things. There's all kinds of benefits that it has of that nature. But if we take it to the next level, we're developing a mind that can be focused with powerful, mindful awareness so that we can begin to discern our own true nature and the true nature of reality. We want to get to that place. And then to use that focused and aware mind to carry out that kind of investigation, to find out why life is the way it is. Why, why am I the way I am? And why, why does my life unfold the way it does? And uh, could it be better? So is meditation, would you consider it kind of the pivotal point of your practice, of your larger practice of, 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 of you know, studying the Buddha's Dharma? Uh, pivotal point in the practice of the Buddha Dharma. Yes, I would. Um, because you, you are Without the skills that you develop in meditation, you're just simply not going to be able to do the other parts of the practice. You know, practice mindful awareness in your daily activities. Well, if you don't meditate, you know, that's a, that's a nice idea, but it's just never going to happen. <laughs> right? Even if you, even if you meditate, uh, you'll have the experience that 
Well, I, I meant to be mindful today, but uh, <laughs> maybe I was for a few minutes here and there. You know. But if, if you don't train the mind in, in focus and in mindfulness, it's never going to happen, most likely. Uh, actually, there's, there's an interesting thing about the way the Buddha Dharma builds on itself. There is uh, there's the practice of virtue, which involves keeping precepts. And what they all come down to is not doing anything that's harmful to yourself or others. You know, it's in the simplest terms. It's uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And we could break all those down and, and talk about them. But, but right speech, right action, right livelihood is speech. Uh, it's it's, it's speech, action, and livelihood that doesn't come, cause harm to either yourself or other beings. That is necessary in order to succeed at meditation. And meditation is the second of the major divisions of, of the path. Um, and, but they work together with each other in order to practice virtue you need to have the mindful awareness that you develop in meditation. But you need to have the practice of virtue in order to be successful in meditation because as you notice when you sit down to meditate, your mind is very active. It's very preoccupied with many kinds of things. And it's very attached to many things. A lot of the things it's attached to aren't particularly wholesome. and They're not doing you any good. Uh, Often there's a lot of worry and remorse that enters into, uh, you, uh, maybe not in, in your daily sitting practice, but if you uh, start getting more deeply into meditation, meditating for longer periods of time, and reaching the deeper meditative states, you're going to find that uh, worry and remorse are huge obstacles to uh, that keep you from actually achieving the very profoundly calm states of mind, the unification of mind that uh, you're looking for. You get right to the point where your mind should achieve this unification, and it doesn't because there's these undercurrents of, of worry and uh, remorse, agitation due to various sources. Well, those don't exist if you lead, lead a virtuous life. If you lead a virtuous life, your, your life is uncomplicated. You don't have things to feel remorse about. You don't have things to worry about. Um, you work in harmony with the world. You work in harmony with other people. Uh, you find that things, there's a certain kind of flow to things. You develop a certain kind of trust. Trust in yourself and trust in the world. That one way or another, things are going to turn out uh, the way they should. And this allows your mind to be very calm and to enter into the very deep states of meditation that uh, you would like. The third part of the path is wisdom. So there's virtue, meditation, and wisdom. And they all work together, too. You have to learn a little bit, acquire a little bit of wisdom to understand, to really understand what the point of being virtuous is, and also what the point is of investing the time to develop skill in meditation practice. But it keeps working together with the other two, and the wisdom is ultimately the culmination, because um, in practicing the Dharma as a whole, if you get to that place where you see things as they truly are, then that is the wisdom that you're after, seeing things as they truly are. And that wisdom is liberating. That wisdom will free you from all future suffering. And that wisdom will replace desire and aversion in your heart with love and compassion. And so you'll get out of bed in the morning not due to uh, worry, fear, desire, and aversion, but you'll get out of bed in the morning uh, motivated by love and compassion. Uh, that's the fruits of, of, of real wisdom. 
but you don't see things as they really are with a mountain mind that's bouncing all over the place and either falling asleep or, or uh, uh, latching on to some useless idea and, and, and just running it around and around and around like a hamster on a wheel. You, you see the true nature of things and you acquire wisdom with a mind that can be, can be focused and directed appropriately and then can investigate in a, in a penetrating way to see what is really there behind the illusion, behind the appearances that uh, we're lost in all of the time. Nothing is the way it appears to be. And it only appears the way that it does to you. It all appears completely differently to everyone else. Every single one of us is in a different room with a different group of people. <laughs> and it's amazing. So, and the, and the important time to be aware of that is when you're unhappy with where you are and what's happening. Because no matter where you are, it, it, it's a projection of your own mind that makes it to be what it is. And if you can unlock the secrets of how that comes to be, then you will no longer have that feeling of being at the mercy of forces outside of yourself. Yes. In the beginning stages of meditation, um, are things happening to your mind and body even if you're unaware of them? Positive? At, at the beginning stages of meditation, are things happening to your mind and body that you're not aware of? I, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Could you clarify that? That, yes, are there things happening that you're not aware of that you can take encouragement from? Absolutely. Very good question. I'm glad you asked that, and it is very true. You see, your mind is doing what it's always done, and actually what it needs for you to do to survive in the world. You have a limited capacity for conscious awareness, which means to be at all effective in any situation, uh, you need to be applying your conscious awareness to whatever is most important at the time. And so the way that your mind works is if you're attending to something and it no longer seems so important, your mind casts about looking for something more important to pay attention to. As a matter of fact, even when you're attending to something that is important, your mind has a tendency to keep checking around to see if there's something else that's more important. And it's a good thing it does this, right? It's a part of what helps us to survive. So when you sit down and meditate, you say, uh, I'm, you ask your mind to behave in a way differently than it normally does. It's going to take a bit of training to accomplish that. But we know that we can direct our attention and we know that we can sustain our attention. It happens all the time. We have a capability for it. So what we're doing in meditation is we're actually training that particular capability that we already have. We don't lose the mind's natural behavior of, of searching through all of the different sensory do domains and searching in the mind itself for you know, the, the things that you're supposed to remember to do and the phone calls and the, uh, and the things that need to be attended to. You don't lose that ability, but what you do is you train the mind that when, when you're meditating or whenever you want it to, the mind can cease this searching behavior. Now, in that process, though, there's going to be a period of time before the training takes hold. You know, it's like training, uh, it's training a puppy. There's another uh, meditation teacher by the name of Jack Cornfield, and he talks about meditation as training the puppy. And 
it's really like that. You're trying to train the, paper, the, the, the puppy to, to go on the paper. So every time the puppy does the wrong thing, then you correct the puppy. So in meditation, every time the mind goes off and does something else, you just gently bring it back until uh, uh, it begins to come back by itself. The, ca the capacity for directed attention is actually an innate uh, mental faculty that we have, what we need to have. I mean, can you imagine what it was like if we were incapable of intentionally directing our attention? So we can. We have a, we have a mental faculty called directed attention. And when we train that, then if we meditate, after a while, the mind will start automatically coming back. But it takes a while. You have to repeat the process enough times before the mind starts to do that. We also have a, a, another mental faculty that is, we could call sustained attention. And it's a good thing we have that, you know, because every time you find yourself needing to dismantle a bomb before it goes on, you know, you need to use sustained attention, right? So we do have it. So you're training the faculty of sustain, sustained attention so that once you're, once you're directed back to where you want to be, you don't take off in another direction again. That too takes a while. So you start practicing meditation and you're going to have to repeat these processes over and over again until these, until these mental processes are adequately trained. But every single time that you correct the puppy, if you do it in the right way, you're a step closer to having completed the training. And so it can be discouraging if you don't know that. You sit down and say, well, my mind, st I still forget the meditation I'm doing. My mind still wanders. And here's where you can do yourself some real harm. You start to develop a negative mental attitude about it. You get angry at yourself, or if you identify your mind, you get angry at yourself. Or you get angry at your mind if you dissociate from it. I want to do this and my mind won't be <laughs> <laughs> uh, So you don't want to get into any kind of a negative mental state about it. Instead, you want to, positive reinforcement works. The, the tendency of your mind to go look for something more interesting, and if it finds it, to get lost in that which is more interesting, is a natural and actually, in terms of your daily life, not a bad thing. So it's, 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 a, and it's a natural thing. In training your mind, what you want to do is positively reinforce the right things rather than the negatively reinforce things that you're not going to have much effect on. So if when your mind, when you forget the meditation object and your mind wanders, if you get mad at yourself, that's going to have the effect of when your mind realizes it's not doing what it's supposed to, it's not going to bring that into conscious awareness. Right? Think of it this way. I, actually, we, we're talking in all the wrong language here. The mind is not one thing. The mind is many different mental processes. And, um, you know, one mental process says, I want to sit down and learn to meditate. Another mental process says, well, why don't we have a nap or go watch TV or you know, go down to uh, St. Elmo's and have a beer with friends. Something like that, right? All these different things going on at once. There, there is no... There is no one cohesive uh, thing in, in this mess. So when one part of your mind formulates the intention to meditate and remain on a meditation object, then other parts of the mind are going to want to do something else. But there is another mental faculty that you have too. And this is one that is always checking to see if you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing and if it's producing the results it's supposed to produce. And it's a good thing we have that. It's, and, and it functions at an unconscious level just like all these other things do. That is what makes you aware of it when your mind is wandering. You know, you, you started out meditating, you, then your mind went to this, and then to that, and then to something else, and then it's lost in that something else. And then suddenly you wake up to the present moment and you realize what's happening. Well, you didn't do that. It was an unconscious mental process doing its job that turned on the light and said, hey guys, you know, what's supposed to be happening isn't what's happening. And what you want, you want that to happen more quickly and 
more easily and more often. It doesn't matter how you'd like to have the light on all the time. So it's really important what you do in that moment of realizing that you were planning your next great project and not meditating. If you get mad at yourself, then, then that very mental process that made you aware that you were doing this says, ouch, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> it's, not, it's not going to be productive. Beating yourself up isn't going to have much effect on that other mental process that said, hey, the sensation of breath is boring, let's go find something more interesting to think about. Because it's been doing that all of your life. And it's going to keep on doing that when you get up from the meditation seat so that you don't absentmindedly step out in the street and get hit by a car. You know, so, so getting mad at yourself because your mind has done that is not going to do much good. But feeling really good about it when your mind brings you into the awareness that something was happening other than you intended, that's going to be, have a very positive effect. So never allow yourself to develop any kind of mental attitude that is uh, negative, self-critical, uh, doubt, uh, dissatisfaction with regard to your meditation practice. This is where faith comes in. You have to have faith, trust, confidence that the practice works. And if you simply repeat the same things over and over again, that you'll get the result if you do it in the right way. Compare meditating with throwing darts, you know, learning to throw darts. If you want to learn to hit the center of the target on a dartboard, you do that by just throwing the darts over and over again. And there's nothing, you know, no matter how mad at yourself, you get at yourself for missing, it's not going to really make your next throw any better. The only thing that makes a difference is just the simple repetition. And every time you throw and see where it landed, in a completely unconscious way, in an unconscious level, your body and your mind are going to learn to produce the desired result. So if you sit down and intend to meditate according to the whatever method you're following, and you follow the instructions, they will produce that result. So you have to have the confidence that indeed something is happening in your mind that you might not be aware of that is, is going to eventually lead to the desired result. Because it most definitely is. Yes. Um, do you see, do you see um, advantages of meditating in a group rather than by oneself? Yes, there are two. One is that meditating in a group, um, it, it helps you to overcome whatever tendency you might have to procrastinate and not meditate. It makes it more fun. You know, you get together with, with uh, somebody else to meditate or with a group to meditate. It, uh, it, it brings in your natural inclinations for sociability and company and things like that. And, and so it uh, reinforces your own commitment to the practice. So that's one of the things that it does. The second thing that it does is a subtler and a little bit more difficult to explain. But it's like if several of us sit down together and we start to meditate, there's sort of a psychic resonance that takes place. And, and we're all going to help each other in, uh, in our practice in that way. And if you can, if you can have uh, one or more people in the group who, that you meditate with who has been meditating for a long time and is very skilled and can reach the more profound states of meditation, everybody is going to notice the difference. Because you're going to, you're going to tune in to that resonance you know, at, some, at some level that is difficult to explain. You're going to, you're going to synchronize, your brain waves are going to synchronize with uh, the uh, skilled meditator's brain waves and, and you'll have a better set. Um, one of the ways I see how important it is to follow the breath is thinking, 
what's the first gift when we come into this world? It's yeah. the breath. And what's the last thing that's taken away is the breath. That's right. So is not every breath in between just as important as that first and the last? I mean, it's sort of like the scriptures say, the holy breath is just breathed yeah. into us. Yes. And every single one is telling us who we are. And that, that is absolutely true. And then what's even more awesome is to realize that very life force is going to every, every living being. Yes. To, to keep those kinds of thoughts in mind is, is very good. It reminds me of a, of a story. Uh, one of the meditation teachers in Thailand, I guess one of the Western students, complained and said, so, what's so important about the breath? Why, you know, why, why are we meditating on the breath? And so the teacher said, hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> After a few minutes, the answer is obvious. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, speaking of breath, how about counting your breaths, which is one of the ways that I first learned how to meditate, was whenever the mind yeah. was going off, come back to yeah. one. Counting is a, uh, counting can be a useful technique. Uh, counting can also quickly become absolutely useless, because one part of your mind can happily count away while the rest of your mind is doing a world tour. <laughs> so, it, to, to retain its potency, it's best to use counting in, uh, in moderation, uh, quite sparingly. Now, I suggest that people count the first ten, count ten breaths each time you sit down. Um, I started to say the first 10 breaths, but after you've been meditating a little while, let's count the first 10 breaths. <laughs> but to do counting, what you do is, is you uh, try to be continuously aware of 10 breaths in a row and, and count them as each one, uh, you know, as, as you succeeded. But when, when you lose awareness of the breath or of part of a breath, if there's, you know, half of an in-breath where your mind was really somewhere else and, and, and you realize that, then go back to one and start over. And start over as many times as you need to until you get to 10. But then when you get to 10, don't bother going past that. And of course, uh, if your mind's not very agitated and you've been meditating for a little while, then that will be your first 10 breaths. The advantage of doing this every time you sit, counting the first 10 breaths, is it conditions your mind so that when you sit down and start counting breaths, you know, then it's sort of, that's, that's the signal that, okay, we're meditating now. Time to let go of, uh, you, in other words, you train your mind that when you start counting your breaths, it's time to let go of the worries of the day and the things you have to attend to later. And, and so it makes it a lot easier to, to go into that meditative state. Now, another way of using counting the breath is, uh, when you're still in uh, a, a stage where uh, you might have a lot of mind wandering or you might have something called monkey mind. I'll explain monkey mind. Uh, monkey mind is when your mind is just rapidly bouncing from one thing to another, you know. So it's it, the sensations of the breath, and then it's a sound, and then it's a thought, and then it's back to the breath, and then it's this, this pain in your knee, and then it's that. And it's like, it's just not staying on anything. It's just moving all over the place. And yes, it may be hitting back on your meditation object, uh, you know, fairly often in the middle of this. There is absolutely no stability to it. So that's monkey mind. And monkey mind is a really good time to start counting can be very useful. Uh, and it, once you've succeeded in getting to 10, continue without the counting. But if, you, if the monkey mind comes back, then go ahead and count another 10 breaths. It's a really useful tool there. Uh, if you're having a kind of sit where there's, uh, it, it's not monkey mind, but there is enough agitation that you're often forgetting the meditation object, uh, then you might go ahead and count 10 breaths again, not just at the beginning, but several times in the course of it. It's an aid to stabilize your mind when there's too much agitation present. 
But the problem with going beyond 10 is that you can slip into this automatic thing and it's not doing you any good anymore. Yeah. You were talking about the different aspects of the mind and um, you know, the short-term focus, the long-term focus, the part of the mind that can see that, you're, that you've lost your intention. And what is the mind? Uh, and what when I when I get a feeling that I recall from my heart, is that my mind more body aware, or how and how much is the brain involved with what you're talking about, and how much is physical perception with seeing and hearing involved, and personal intention? It's very confusing. Okay. Yes, I, I know. It certainly is. It's a it's a word that is not very clearly defined. And we, we speak of the mind as if it is a single thing, and it's not. And we speak of my mind as if somehow it belongs to us, or, or at least uh, we're responsible for it, and it's not really true <laughs> either. Uh, I think it's very helpful to think of your mind as many different mental processes, most of which are occurring at not consciously. That only a very tiny part of those mental consciousness, mental processes are in conscious awareness at any given time. And many of them are never are. They're, they're permanently invisible to conscious awareness. Um, to the simplest distinction to make is between mind and matter. So in that case, mind includes what you call the, the feelings and the in inclinations and intuitions and things like that that you might uh, use other terminology for. You might say from your heart, but uh, if, you, if you just make the distinction between mind and matter, then heart is part of mind because Obviously, something coming from your heart isn't coming from that mass of pulsating cells that's pumping your blood around. You know, that's matter. But uh, mind is the mental stuff that uh, our emotions, um, our emotions are mind. And there's actually different mental processes that are responsible for producing emotions. And... Um, they do so on the basis of the, the information that they get from other parts of the mind. So uh, the emotions that you experience in any given moment is going to be the result of uh, processes that you're not aware of, but it's going to be an integration of your past experience with your present experience. And somehow in the interweaving of that, the part of your mind that uh, has the job of uh, turning on the feeling of anxiety when something's wrong might get the message that, oh, it's time for that. Turns on the switch and you're flooded with anxiety, you see. But if, if you tried to unravel it, uh, you'd find that, that there's a variety of things that have interacted in bringing it to that particular point where, where the... Uh, uh, mental state of anxiety arises. So, to say, when that happens, to say to yourself, I am anxious, is to actually reinforce that. And basically, at, to, to think to yourself, I am anxious, is to, to send a, a, a quick memo to all of these other mental processes and say, this is this is the state of the moment, and if they all buy into it, then you're really, really anxious. <laughs> if instead you can look at it more objectively and say, oh, there's anxiety arising, obviously due to causes and conditions. I can't change the causes and conditions. All I can do is deal with the anxiety that, I, that has arisen. And if you don't 
buy into it, you're sending a different memo to all these other mental processes. It's, hey guys, we got anxiety to deal with. I need some help there. <laughs> Instead of, of, oh no, we're anxious. <laughs> I don't know if that got to the gist of your question or, or not. Would you say that there are any levels that are higher than others? Is everything pretty much equal in Well, actually, that's one of the things. There, there is no, there is no big guy at the top. Uh, our mental processes. See, this is the wonderful thing that comes from meditation and from practicing mindfulness in your daily life. Is you start to see these things more clearly as they are, and what you'll see is that there are there there there's all of these different mental processes taking place. And they are hierarchically arranged. But there is no guy at, top, at the top. That is an illusion. What there is at any given moment, there are a number of these senior processes that are basically acting like a, a committee to decide where you're at at the moment. And there are other senior processes that can, can enter and leave the meeting as well, which is one of the reasons why it's really good to slow down. Because something happens, you know, and if the, if the few members of your executive committee that are present at the moment are all in favor of you, you know, say, hauling off and punching somebody because of what's happened, it's really good to wait a few minutes and let different members show up and have a better <laughs> So there's there really the guy at the top isn't really a guy at the top. It's more like a, a constantly changing uh, committee that that makes decisions. Sounds like the government. <laughs> yeah. It is it is kind of kind of like a government different in a few ways. And, uh, <laughs> and that's what, you know, the, the idea that we have that we are a self, that there is, there is a self, this is a convenient illusion that our mind creates. It's very functional, you know. Uh, we, we tell ourselves the story of our lives and the story of who we are. And the, the I that we think we are, the self that we think we are, is the narrative center of gravity. But when you examine it, even the most cursory examination of it, you find that uh, it, it, it's not, you know, it, it, it's not one thing, it's not one character. That all these different narratives generated at different not times uh, have a slightly different narrative center of gravity, and you'd never be able to pick between them and say, well, that's my real self, and these others are not, because that, that, that's just, that would, that would be nonsense. It's not really the case at all. And you, the mind's not a thing, it's a process, and it's not one process, it's many processes. And the self is just a convenient way for the mind to to keep track of how all of these processes are unfolding in time. So if we become attached to that convenient fiction, then uh, we end up with all kinds of problems. We end up with an ego that's capable of being insulted or offended or suffering from uh, inadequacy or insecurity or loss or Yes? Um, if I'm meditating and I'm thinking about my breath and then I get some thought from somewhere, my friend says she thinks thinking too much, she tells herself thinking too much. And, yeah. um, so am I supposed to get rid of that thought? Just now that is a very good question. Yes, okay. Uh, if you're meditating and other thoughts come along, are you supposed to be getting rid of those thoughts? 
And this is something that I realized that I didn't really make clear in the instruction that I gave at the beginning of this talk. What you want to do is you want to keep your attention focused on the breath. You don't want to try to stop anything else at all from happening. Let the thoughts come and go. You will be aware of sounds. You'll be aware of sensations. You're not trying to stop anything. What you're trying to do is to be continuously aware of the sensations of the breath. That's all. You're trying not to lose that awareness. And then when you start to get even a little bit good at not losing that awareness, then you want to make that awareness to be you, to be predominant, you know, so that your attention is still shared amongst many things, but you, you start to bring it into more and more of a closer focus on the breath. But there's no need to try to make anything stop. Now, your friend, you said your friend, when she says that she finds that there's thoughts coming, she says to herself, thinking too much. And see, that's a kind of device that you can use, and there's many ways of doing it. It's just what saying that to herself does is it helps to bring her in, bring everything into the perspective. Oh yes, the thought's going on, but this is what I want to be paying attention to. And so anything that's, that fulfills that purpose, and there's nothing wrong at all with having something that you say to yourself. Although after a while you won't need to do that. As the faculty of directed attention begins to uh, respond to the training, your attention just will flow back to the object, and there's no need to, to, to say something to yourself. But if, if saying something to yourself helps, then absolutely go ahead and do it. The only thing you don't want to do is to say something to yourself that causes you to start thinking something else. Whatever it is you do, the, 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 the result of it should be, the immediate result of it should be, is that you let go of your attachment to whatever else it was that was taking you away, and you bring yourself back to doing the practice until the next time you're carried away. And do it that in a really relaxed, easy, you know, just however many times it repeats, it repeats. After a while, though, you get to the place where your attention stays on your meditation object, and then it's really fascinating because then you really start to have a clear awareness of the inner landscape of your mind. You start to be aware of all the different things that are going on at the same time. It's, it's interesting that when you can stay focused on one thing, how it allows everything else to be understood in a way that it can't when your attention's going all over the place. When your mind starts to be still, then you start to see the different kinds of thoughts that are coming and going and how they go about their comings and goings. Because you're not, you're not really looking directly at them, you're, just, you're, you're seeing them out of the corner of your mind's eye, so to speak. And this, this allows you to see their behavior. You start to see how bodily sensations and sounds enter awareness and leave awareness, and what effect they have. Effect they have. But, you know, a sound enters your awareness, and your mind may react to it in a particular way. And so, as you come to, as your mind comes to be steadier, then you begin to have this much, much clearer understanding of the nature of your mind. You begin to see the things that I was talking about a few minutes ago. You know, when it, you get to that point and you look and you say, oh yeah, I see what he means. Yeah, sure, yeah. My mind's not one thing, it's all these different processes. And look how they interact and look how they behave. And look how they compete to be in the limelight. But eventually what happens in your practice, if you continue, you can uh, have an experience that's called single-pointed attention or single-pointedness. And this is a really wonderful and valuable thing that when you come to that, what that means is that you can learn to be so focused on one thing that you can successfully ignore everything else and when you successfully ignore everything else, these other things start to go away. The analogy is, you know, that if you're, if you're a parent and you've got young children and they want attention, you're doing something important, 
and they keep trying to get your attention. If you ignore them long enough, after a while they go off and find something more interesting to do. It's the same thing in your mind. If you can stay successfully focused on one thing and ignore all of these different thoughts and ignore these bodily sensations and things like that that come up, after a while they just kind of disappear. Like those mental processes that, oh, this is no fun anymore, let's go. And they dive down into the unconscious level and they do their thing. So that, uh, that when, when you reach the stage in your practice that you're ready to cultivate single-pointedness, then that is the first time that you could describe yourself as having an interest in seeing these other things go away. Until that point, it's all a question of letting them be. Let them come, let them be, let them go. And all you are concerned with as the meditator is keeping your attention focused where you want it to be focused while everything else does come and go. And that makes it a lot easier. If you try to stop things from happening in your mind, you're going to have a very frustrating meditation. Because there is no you that's in charge that those other parts of your mind are going to respond to, period. So maybe it's good to have the experience of trying just to satisfy yourself with that. If you think you're in charge of your mind. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when we're talking about meditation, we're asking our mind to do really the only thing that our mental center of gravity that we think we are is capable of doing, which is directing our attention and attempting to sustain it. That is pretty well the limit of, of what what we can accomplish in, in, in terms of will. You know, the, the limit of your will is where your attention goes. So make use of it. 